This is an emergency. Send an ambulance to the corner of Birrell Street and Bronte Road. Yes, 11 people have been asphyxiated. Anything serious? No. Dr. Hamilton. Sorry, Doctor. But we've had newspaper reporters all over this bus asking questions. Any answers? One. It wasn't carbon monoxide. I've had this engine revved to its capacity with one of the floorboards up on the back, not a whiff. Come and have a look. Look at those gauges. Not one of those needles has moved a millimeter. Got any ideas? Yes, but you won't like it. Try me. Witchcraft. Well, I told you you wouldn't like it, but it's the best I could come up with. Yeah. Well, when you arrived, did you notice any unusual odours? There was a smell. But you're not going to believe this. It smelled like perfume. Mm-hmm. And what's your next step, Mr... Uh... Dale, Inspector Dale. Well, we'll take it back to the shop and take it apart and put it together again. But like I said, this vehicle is in perfect condition. And I've got 20 years' experience back of me to prove it. Yes, I'm sure you have, Inspector. Uh, let me know what you find, will you? Well, I doubt that there's much more I can tell you, except for what I've already said. But one way or another, I'll give you a call, OK? Thanks. I'd appreciate that. just a word in the dictionary. Pollution is the name of the number one killer of this century. And today's experience should tell us that the time for action has arrived. Something must be done, not tomorrow, next week, next month, but now. Visualize what would have happened if that bus had been driving down a city street. Picture the horror of that uncontrolled mass of steel bearing down on you. Imagine people helplessly standing by while others fly for their lives. And what if the people inside hadn't been pulled out in time? I tell you it happened this morning, it will happen again. I give you my word for it. Factories pour out scum into the water we drink. Smokestacks belch out black smoke into our lungs. Our food is sprayed with insecticide and we commit suicide by eating it. I call on every man, woman and child within the sound of my voice to join me in this crusade, this war against self-annihilation. Hello? Oh, yes, Doctor. More tests. Ah, uh, yes, yes, tomorrow will be fine. Thank you, Doctor. <clears throat> Evening. Well? Well, what? Ah. Uh, You've moved the rook. Don't be funny. Oh, well, um... Cleaned the windows? No. I know I forgot to kiss you when I came in. I put this on to make a point. You've made the point. I would rather kiss you au naturel. The point is, is it sanitary? What would you rather it be? Sanitary or sensuous? Evidently, you didn't hear Dr. John Stanford on the news broadcast, or you wouldn't act like this. I heard him on the car radio. Are you going to move? 
And you don't think there's any danger? If you move that, there's a danger that I'll take it. Ah, you're so right. Did you see the picture of all those poor people lying all over the sidewalk? I was there. You were? How'd that happen? They called an ambulance. Who called? I don't know, some bloke. Did he call right after it happened? Yes, he called right after it happened. Well, what did he say? He said, send an ambulance. Will you please pay attention to the game? Is that all he said? Send an ambulance? Didn't he say where to send it to? Of course he did. Look, are you going to play the game or ask a lot of silly questions? I'm going to play the game and ask a lot of silly questions. Check. I want to know his exact words. All right. He said, this is an emergency. Send an ambulance to the corner of Burrell Street and Bronte Road. Eleven people have been asphyxiated. But, Steve, that doesn't make any sense. What doesn't make any sense? I'll show you. No, no, can't you tell me? No, you watch. I'm walking down the road, see? <whistles> Suddenly, I see this bus come crashing up the sidewalk. It didn't crash, it just stopped. Oh, whatever. I rush up to it and... Uh, uh, what are you doing? I'm opening the doors open from the inside, you know. Yes, I am. Uh, I finally get them open. I look in. One, two, three, four. That's it, you're finished. I'm finished. Right, let's get on with the game. But Steve, don't you see? It doesn't make any sense. All right, I'll ask. What doesn't make sense? Why would he stop to count the people before he made the phone call? That's right. Of course it's right. Checkmate. Sneaky but clever. I'll settle for cunning and brilliant. Excuse me. Could you tell me where I find Mr. Dale? Inspector Dale's under that one. Inspector Dale? Oh, hello, Doctor. You're a little early. I was going to phone you, but I hadn't quite finished. Well, everything's ship shape with old Nellie here. She's definitely a non smoker. Glad to hear it. One thing. What's that? Where did the run start? You mean, uh, where did she go into service? Yep. Hang on. <clears throat> right here, from the depot. That'll be about, what, three kilometers to where the accident happened. Accident? Well, uh, witchcraft. Three would be about right. Why? I wonder if you could tell me how many people paid fares between here and there. Oh, uh, that's easy. I got all the information from the office this morning. Let's see now. Why are you so interested in this thing, Doctor? Oh, it's not me. It's my wife. She's uh, nosy. <laughs> that's not so good for a doctor, is it? Oh, I don't know. It's not so bad either. It can be helpful sometimes. Well, there were 11 fares paid. 11? You sure? That's what it says right here. I hope that satisfies your wife. Yes, I'm sure it will. Thanks, Inspector. Mrs. Quigley? Yes, Mr. Perkins? You may send the sister in now. Yes, sir. You may go in now, sister. Thank you. Sorry you had to wait so long, sister. Won't you sit down? Thank you. Now, sister, what can I do for you? It's about the St. John Parish Orphanage. A fine organization. I'm acquainted with it. Indeed you are, Mr. Perkins. You've been one of our most generous contributors. <laughs> Bless you. Thank you. I'm sorry. I, I have a cold in the least little draught. Uh, do you mind closing the window? Not at all.
Thank you. That's better. Um, this summer, the orphanage would like to send the children to the country where they may enjoy the fresh air and, and so... And you wish me to make a contribution? Well, you've been so very generous in the past. We thought that perhaps you might... How much do you need? Whatever amount you're prepared to give, Mr. Perkins. Um, a check, if you don't mind. I'm oh. not a very good bookkeeper. <laughs> Frankly, sister, neither am I. Bookkeeping these days is a lost art. We've all been taken over by computers. Uh, not God, Mr. Perkins. Ah, yes, of course. <laughs> Uh, what is your name, sister? Maria Teresa, but uh, make it out to the St. John Parish Orphanage Limited. Mm. Strange to have to add limited, but everything's a corporation, isn't it? <laughs> Not God, Sister Teresa. Oh, yes. <laughs> Bless you. <laughs> Thank you. There. I hope that would help. You're so kind. Uh, it's deductible, you know. Yes, I know. I'll give Father Daly my regards. I will. Goodbye. Oh, my. I almost forgot. <laughs> From the children at the orphanage. What is it? A little something they made to show their appreciation. Goodbye. Thank you again. Perkins here. Would you mind addressing it for me? I hate to carry this around. Certainly, sister. Well, who took the order? He did? Well, he should know better. Well, he knows we can't deliver on time. Look, tell him to ring them back and tell them that the goods are held up at the docks. Here you are, sister. Oh, yes. Thank you. Mr. Perkins is such a generous man. I'm sure he appreciates how much the children need the fresh air. <coughs> Bert told me about the funny smell on the bus yesterday. It sounded a lot like this, so I thought I'd better call you. How is he? Fine, like the people on the bus. No after effects. OK, let's go in. Come in. Mr. Perkins, this is Dr. Hamilton. Hello, Doctor. Um, Detective Sergeant Gilberts. Detective Sergeant? What is all this? I just had a fainting spell, that's all. Do you have these spells often? Never. Perhaps I've been working too hard and forgot to take lunch. Did you call the police? No. I just phoned for the ambulance because you looked as if you were going to... I mean, you looked so ill. The reason we're here, Mr. Perkins, is to find out if you can help us. In what way? We're investigating an incident on a bus. All the passengers were overcome by fumes. Yes, I read about it. But how does it concern me? Well, the gasping for breath, the uh, sudden blacking out, and when you come to, no apparent side effects. All that is consistent with what happened to the passengers. Could have been a coincidence. Yes, it could, except in this room is the same distinct, sweet-smelling odour that was on that bus. This window, do you always keep it open? Always. Then it was open when you... Uh, come were... to think of it, though, it was closed. Sister Maria Teresa asked me to close it. Who's she... uh, Sister Maria Teresa? She's a nun at St. John's Parish. She was here collecting contributions for the orphanage. And what's this? A gift from the children of the orphanage. This Sister Maria Teresa gave it to me. Do you know what's in it? No. Open it, if you wish. This is your second warning. The next will be the last. Uh, some crackpot rang up. He said if we didn't stop polluting the air, he'd blow the place up. Did you report it? I didn't take it seriously. When did he call? About a week ago. But he sounded so calm and matter of fact, I thought it was a joke. I'd forgotten it until now. Why would he accuse you of polluting the air? I would imagine he was referring to the industrial waste in our smokestack. I didn't take any notice. We're well below the dangerous emission level anyway. Evidently, your caller didn't agree. If he rings again, would you get in touch with the police? Have no fear. I certainly will.
I spoke to the convent on the telephone. They say Sister Maria Teresa passed away three months ago. She was 89. Ah, oh, we must have got the wrong information. Sorry to have bothered your father. No trouble at all. Now, uh, won't you come in for a spot of tea? Well, it's very kind of you, Father, but uh, I have to be on the way. Some other time, then. Uh, drop in when you're in the neighborhood. Uh, thanks, I will. Oh, uh, Father, do you happen to know Mr. Perkins of the Perkins factory? Why, yes. It's strange you should ask. There was a check in the mail from him this very morning. It was made out to the orphanage. Uh, we thought it unusual. We're, we're not even asking for contributions at this time. We're grateful, of course. It was very thoughtful of him. Yes, indeed it was. Well, good day to you, Father. Thank you very much. How'd you go? It seems our nun is not a nun after all. I'm very glad about that. I almost lost faith. Well, it seems she gave a pretty good performance. And she didn't keep the cash, she sent it to the orphanage. What's the next step? Our next step is elementary, my dear Dr. Watson. We look for a young actress who was raised in an orphanage and who hates poison air. <laughs> Kill. As an actor, you'd make a very good detective. Thanks very much. You know, Steve, I don't know why we're worried about this. We've probably heard the last from these people. What about the bomb threat? Of course, just a threat. VKG to car 12, car 12. Proceed immediately to the government bus depot, Bondi Junction. Gas asphyxiation in workshop. You see, you can still smell us. Did you see this man who turned it on? No, when I noticed the odor, I turned around to see where it was coming from. I could see the vapor. There was a bloke standing next to us. I yelled at him to turn off the valve, but he didn't move. He just stood there with his back to me. I walked over to turn it off myself, and the bloke turns and looks at me, and bang. That's all I remember. Everything went blank. What did he look like? I don't know. He had one of these, uh, oh, sort of gas mask on. Uh, fingerprint man's on his way. Is this one of your tanks? I wouldn't know. They're all the same to me. Well, how would he get in here without being seen? I wouldn't know that either. We have things coming in and going out around here all the time. Inspector Dale? Yeah? Do you know what this means? Well, I didn't write it. I didn't ask you that. I'm sorry, Doctor. All of this has uh, been a bit nerve-wracking. First the letters, then the phone call. Not to mention these demonstrators outside. I think you'd better tell us about the letter and the phone call. Pollution. To blame an us for it. Can you imagine that? I tell you what, mister, if I was Premier, I'd take the buses off the road and then watch them complain. Yeah, well, let's get back to the phone call. Did anyone threaten to blow up the place? Yeah, a man. He was quite calm about it. I told him to go to hell and then I... You think they may do it? I think they might try. We could appeal to the bombers. Tell them we're ready to sacrifice. Sacrifice what? Our car. We could sell it. Then someone else would be using it. Oh, then we could put it into storage. How'd you get to surfers for your holiday? Oh, by bus. I mean train. That's diesel fuel. Aeroplane? Jet fuel. Oh. We could use bicycles and close down all the factories, then we'd have 10% cleaner air and 100% unemployment. And no money to buy the bicycles. All right, we don't sell the car, we'll appeal to their better sense of judgment. Whose better sense of judgment? The people who want to bomb these places. And how do we do that? Dr. John Stanford. He's a convincer. He could convince them not to go ahead with their plan. Funny you should mention him. I was going to see Dr. Stanford in the morning. I bet you were. You don't believe me? No, of course I don't. But if you're going, I'm going with you. Well, that wasn't part of the plan. It is now. <laughs> All right. Come to the office tomorrow about lunchtime. You can ride over on the handlebars of my bicycle. <laughs> well, I've got to go to town anyway. It's a date.
Well, the fingerprints on the large canister paid off. Terry Lucas, university student. One minor arrest for disturbing the peace during a demonstration. What sort of demonstration? Well, he's in all of them. This particular one was against daylight saving time. He claimed it was a violation of his civil rights for the sun to set an hour later than nature intended. <laughs> Doesn't sound like the sort of bloke who'd get mixed up in a uh, jelly knife. Yeah, you're right. He's one of those slow-thinking blokes who wouldn't know how to fly, a real believer in causes. He's a follower, not a leader. In other words, not very bright, but very, very gullible. Better watch those blokes. They can sometimes uh, explode. Hmm. You picking him up? When we find him, they've moved. They? He's married. His wife's a demo, too. No record, but uh, we found out something very interesting. She's an actress. The nun? Yeah, could be. We're checking on theatres and all the movie studios. What about the small canister? Well, good prints, no identification. We talk to the manufacturers and they just make the cans, not what goes inside. And they sell them to scientific laboratories. Like the Department of Experimental Chemistry at the university? That could be a connection. Lucas is a student there. I'll find out if the university is one of the buyers. And I'll get all the information I can on Dr. Stanford. You think he's mixed up in this? He's the head of the Experimental Chemistry Laboratory, that's all. You've been talking to Jean again. No. She's been talking. I've been listening. Oh, why can't I go in with you? Because it's official business and you're not an official. You can go in when I come out. Well, that kind of equality may make me a strong supporter of women's lib. Do officials' wives have any rights at all? Yes, they have the right to wait in the car. Listen, love, keep an ear on this, will you? Gil might call in only a few hours left on that bomb threat. Well, what do I do if it goes off? Lean on that horn till I arrive. Well, that's a bit undignified for an official's wife. It's an undignified business. Won't be long. Dr. Hamilton, so pleased to see you. I've been reading about you in the newspapers. You've been quite busy. So have you, Dr. Stanford. Well, if you mean my campaign against pollution, I believe we are gaining ground. Did you hear my broadcast after that bus tragedy? Tragedy? Well, accident then. It served to awaken the population to the dangers we face. I take it you didn't hear my broadcast? I heard it. I found it interesting. Interesting? That's all, only interesting. Oh, I also found it frightening, far-fetched and unrealistic. Then you don't believe that pollution is the number one killer of this century? Of course not. And neither do you, Dr. Stanford. And you don't admit there is a danger? Oh, yes, it's danger in everything we do. Uh, sleeping, walking, talking. Now, talking can be very dangerous. Hitler and Mussolini had everyone believing whatever they said. They were probably responsible for more deaths than every disease. Are you comparing me to Hitler? <laughs> of course not, Doctor. I'm simply saying some people have that dangerous capability and can cause panic. It's not my intention to cause panic. But people must be made to know the facts. What are the facts, Dr. Stanford? Well, the facts are that years ago we were breathing pure air. And dying younger. Today the people's lifespan has increased by, oh, 60%. Due only to medical science. Oh, not medical science alone. Other sciences? Transportation, communication, technology of all kinds has helped. And you must remember the population of the world has increased 100 times. As a medical man, you must admit that impure air is detrimental to health. As a medical man, I know the human body can adjust. True to people with respiratory problems, then pollution is harmful. But medical science is looking for a solution. What's your solution, Dr. Stanford? Yellow fever. A pretty mosquito called Stegemeyer was the cause of yellow fever. Eliminate Stegemeyer, eliminate yellow fever. Eliminate the gasoline engine, you eliminate pollution. It's as simple as that. Well, it's not quite that simple. In 1882, there was this disease called anthrax that killed off thousands of animals. 
Then along came Louis Pasteur, and he found the cure. Vaccine. Vaccination by the spores of the disease itself. Are you saying that if we have enough carbon monoxide inside our system, we too will be immune? I'm simply saying that the human body can adjust to any condition. Well, I don't intend to stand by and let people suffer until that happens. It's almost time for my class. Is there anything else you wish to discuss? I'm sorry, Doctor. I got carried away. I wonder if you could tell me something about that canister. I'm sure I can. We use the same type in our experiment laboratory. What did you want to know? The type of gas that was in it. I'd better be careful. Your department may have fingerprints they wish to preserve. Oh, no, it's quite all right. 79477. Yes, that's... Uh, uh, just a moment. Yes, yes, a version of XQ4. Fast-acting gas developed in Germany to subdue violent mental patients. Its holding effect is of short duration. It's perfectly harmless and non-toxic. Is it on the market? No, no, no. You'd have to get it from a laboratory. Although I do believe a milder version is sold to postmen to calm unfriendly dogs. Could that canister have come from your laboratory? Oh, definitely. Our students experiment with everything from aspirin to atomic bombs. Thank you very much for your help, Dr. Stanford. Stanford, I, I've been watching you on television. I agree with everything you say. I've come all the way from Woiwoi to get your autograph. Goodbye, Doctor. Anything I can do, just call. I will. Who shall I sign it to? Oh, uh, to my sister Betty. She's a revolutionary. Did you get the message? Yes, I did. Why didn't you blow the horn? I did. It wouldn't work. Oh. What was that autograph bit all about? Well, you ignored me. I had to think of something. Like Woi Woi? You've never been to Woi Woi in your life. I know, but it's such a cute name. I like to say it. Woi Woi. Sounds good. Anyway, I got what you were after, Stanford's fingerprints. How did you know I wanted his fingerprints? I knew. Right on there, the whole hand. Are you pleased? Yes, but how did you know I wanted them? Oh, the same way I knew what was on your mind the first night you asked me out to dinner. Do you think I'm too much? <laughs> too much of you there'll never be. Well, how'd we go? The Prince match. Ah. Your handbag, sir. <laughs> Very funny. Well, that's that. Well, did you get anything out of Stanford? Only that the gas could have come from his laboratory. Find Lucas yet? I was still looking for him. Only a couple of hours left, Gil. Yeah, well, we've got the garage and the factory bottled up. They'll find it hard to get in there. How about the bomb squad? Units at both places. Well, Stanford's prints may be on the canister, but we won't be able to do anything about him. He's admitted that the can may have come from his laboratory. Can't you keep him busy answering questions, That's get him out of the way? Smacks of police harassment. I'm not anxious to find out if my old uniform still fits, but we'll keep an eye on him. 
Hamilton. Yeah. Gilberts. Yeah. All yeah, right. No, just stay there. We'll be right over. Found Terry's wife. She's working on a film at Supreme Studios. Let's go. And guess what? They're the studios that are right next door to the Perkins factory. Good, everyone. Take a lunch break. Uh, what a way to earn a living. <laughs> Have you seen Lucas? No. No, come on. Oh, Mrs. Lucas. Yes? Detective Sergeant Gilbert, CIB. Yes? It's about a box you left in Mr. Perkins' office. It served its purpose, didn't it? The orphanage received a donation. Mr. Perkins wasn't hurt. It was just a prank. If you want to arrest me, go ahead, but I don't think your case will stand up in court. Now I get front page publicity. Is that what you're interested in, eh? Publicity? Do you realize the risk involved in such a prank? Who are you? Dr. Hamilton, police medical officer. Nobody was hurt. More by good luck than good judgment. And as a matter of the threatening note. You must have read it wrong. It only said, this is your second warning, the next one will be the last. It could mean the last time we'd bother him. This is no time for games, Mrs. Lucas. People's lives are in danger, particularly that of your husband's. What do you mean? The factory next door and the bus depot are surrounded by police. If your husband shows up with a bomb, he's likely to be shot. But there isn't a bomb, it's harmless gas. Dr. Stanford told you that, didn't he? Well, Dr. Stanford is an idealist. No. No, no, no. Dr. Stanford is a fanatic. He originated the bomb threat. Now ask yourself this. Would he do anything to get that message across? Well, Mrs. Lucas, would he? Dr. Stanford assured us there'd be no danger to anyone. We don't care about that. We're looking for your husband. Where is he? There isn't a bomb, is there? Where is he? Terry wouldn't even... Where? Next door. Perkins factory. Looks like you could use a little help. Terry's got a police record. He'd put away for a long time if they find a bomb on him. We believe in what Terry's doing. And anyhow, there isn't a bomb. Oh, you'll wait for him, will you? What, three to five years? They wouldn't do that. Breaking and entering, at least. What can we do? Maybe I could talk to him. <sighs> Next door, over the roof. The roof? To get to the air conditioning shaft so the gas had spread. Or a small explosive could be confined. No. It wouldn't be a bomb. Stanford promised.
Who's there? Stanford. Dr. Stanford couldn't make it. Who are you? Dr. Hamilton. A friend of Dr. Stanford's? Yeah. Why did he send you along? Doesn't he trust me? Of course he does. You might need help. I don't need any help. Well, your wife thought you might. She's the one who told me where you were. I, th I thought uh, maybe you were a cop. I'm a friend. You, you believe in this cause? Don't you? Yeah. Oh, sure. It's, uh, it's just that, you know, it's, sometimes when I've got to do things like this, I'm... Here, take that bed off, will you? Is this the air conditioning shaft? Yeah, it goes all the way down to the basement. What do we do when we get the vent off? Oh, well, Dr. Stamper said I've got to pull this red string on the box and then drop it down the shaft. What happens then? Well, nothing. I die in the morning. And then when they turn on the air conditioning, it blows the, uh, the gas all through the building. There can't be much gas in that box. You sure it's gas? Sure that's not gel ignite? Pull the string, blow up the whole building. Crazy. It, it, it's gas. It, it, it's a harmless gas. It, it, it's the same, same one I used in, in the garage. It didn't hurt anyone. Are you sure it's the same thing? It could be an explosive. Yeah, I'm sure. This, this is a peaceful protest. We don't believe in violence. Well, Dr. Stanford does. It's a lie. I'll show you. Don't touch it, Terry. It is an explosive. You pull that string, you blow yourself up. I put the box on the floor and walk away from it. I, I, I don't understand. You, you put it on the floor. If you don't, I'll put a bullet through your head. Better do as he says. He's lying. You're both lying. It, 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 it's... it's... It's a gas, it's not explosive. Look, I'll prove it. Don't be stupid. Don't be stupid. There's 60 seconds delayed action from the time you pull that string to the explosion. You pull it, I can shoot you both, be up on the roof and across to the next building before this place blows up. You called me stupid. You, you, you think I'm stupid? I don't be foolish. You think I'm a fool? Very useful to me, Terry. I want you with me always. We've got a lot of causes to fight, you and I. But let's finish this one first, all right? All right. What do you want me to do? I want you to tie him up. Why? You said he was a friend of yours. He's a policeman. You, you lied. You said you were a doctor. I am a doctor. A police doctor. That's the same thing. He can put you in prison for the rest of your life. Do you want that? Get that plate off, tie him up, throw the bomb down the shaft, and then you and I can get out of here, okay? Okay. All right, Doctor, get that vent off. Stanford, you really do think Terry's stupid, don't you? Shut up. You said it. You, you, you said oh, I was stupid and a fool. I didn't mean it. Well, what did you mean? I meant just sort of gullible. Forget it, will you? How can he forget it? You're calling him a gullible, stupid fool. Gullible! Ah! He's using you, Terry. And now he's going to use you to kill a lot of innocent people. That's it, isn't it, Doctor? It's what you've been doing. You, you've been using me to do all your dirty work. All right, all right, we'll go ahead and shoot. I'll show you how, how stupid I can be.
the way, it's a bomb! I don't understand how a man like Stanford got his position at the university in the first place. He's forgetting he's a brilliant scientist, credentials to prove it, just an obsession took control of it. Now what's going to happen to him now? Mental institution, hospital, I don't know. <laughs> what about Terry? I'm a doctor, love, not a judge. Now can we get on with the chess game? Of course we can get on with the chess game, but I've got one more question. Where were you standing when Terry dropped the box? Well, I was standing on his left, yeah. Well, I don't see how that's possible, Steve. Why not? Well, let's pretend this is Stanford here. And let's say the castle is Terry, and this is you standing here. Oh, no, no, no. I was standing there. Are you sure? Positive. Oh, well, let's get back to the game then. Checkmate. Oh, come on. <laughs> Hamilton. Hmm. Yes, she's here. Just a minute. For you. It's a man. Oh. Hello. Oh, yes, Doctor. Oh, that's great. Yes, okay. Thank you. Stephen. Mm-hmm. You'll uh you'll have to get a raise. <laughs>